I am honoured to perform the final duty of the United Kingdom as Chair in Office of the Commonwealth and hand over the baton to President Kagame and wish him every success as Chair of our unique association, encompassing 54 countries and a third of humanities. One of our newest members is now at the helm, and more nations are seeking to join, which tells you everything you need to know about the health and vitality of our Commonwealth, because for all the differences between us, we are united by an invisible thread of shared values, history, and friendship. The head of the Commonwealth, the head of the Commonwealth, Her Majesty the Queen, incarnates everything that brings us together, and it's fitting that in the year of her platinum jubilee, the association she cherishes should be gathering in the continent where she became queen. When the UK became your chair in office in 2018, the word COVID had not been invented. Many of us had no idea what a coronavirus was, and nobody could have known that the worst pandemic for a century would soon claim millions of lives. The British government put together the partnership between Oxford University and AstraZeneca that produced the world's most popular vaccine. And during our time as chair in office, the UK supported the delivery of more than 1.4 billion doses of COVID vaccines to Commonwealth countries. The, thank you. The pandemic posed a common threat to all humanity. And the same is true of catastrophic climate change. No one understands this better than our Commonwealth friends in the Caribbean, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, who can see the incoming tide surging ever higher up their beaches, threatening to inundate their villages and towns, and in time, the entire landmass of some island states. For them, the baleful effects of climate change aren't vague or theoretical, but already happening before their eyes. When we hosted COP26 in Glasgow last November, it was these fellow Commonwealth leaders who spoke with the greatest urgency and authority about the perils of quilting the earth with greenhouse gases. And we in the developed world have an obligation to help our friends to cope with a danger they had no hand in causing. And during the UK's time as chair in office, the Commonwealth Finance Access Hub mobilized over $38 million for the most vulnerable members. But of course, we must press on and do more. And if I could imagine a silver bullet that would solve an array of problems and transform countless lives. It would be to give every girl in the world the chance to go to school. At the last, at the last Chogham in London in 2018, the UK announced £212 million for the Girls' Education Challenge. And I'm delighted to say that this initiative is now at work in 11 Commonwealth countries, ensuring that girls are able to gain at least 12 years of quality education. We need to empower them to play their full part in the economy when they leave school. So the UK is funding the She Trades Commonwealth program, which has already helped over 3,500 women-owned businesses to become more competitive and generate more than £32 million pounds worth of sales. And if there is anyone who doubts the ability of the Commonwealth to speak with one voice, it was in June 2020 that the UK delivered the first ever joint statement by all 54 Commonwealth members before the Human Rights Council in Geneva, recalling, and I quote, our proud history of acting to strengthen good governance and the rule of law. One of the greatest affronts to everything we stand for is Russia's invasion of Ukraine 
and Putin's blockade of the ports that would otherwise be shipping food to the world's poorest people. At this moment, nearly 25 million tonnes of corn and wheat is piled up in silos across Ukraine, held hostage by Russia. Britain supports the United Nations' plan to get that food out, and we will invest over £370 million in global food security this year, including £130 million for the World Food Programme. We want to work alongside our Commonwealth friends to understand your needs, your priorities, and to deliver joint solutions to a crisis that Putin has deliberately engineered. For now, it only remains for me to thank every Commonwealth member for having given the United Kingdom the chance to serve as chair in office. And as I pass on this responsibility to President Kagame, a close friend and a partner, I know that he shares my boundless optimism about the future of the Commonwealth at the forefront of the international agenda and benefiting all our peoples. Thank you all very much. On behalf of the Queen in this Platinum Jubilee year, my wife and I are delighted uh, to be with you all here in Rwanda for this 26th Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. I treasure the friendships we have built over these past 70 years and look forward to their deepening in the years ahead. As we build back from the pandemic that has devastated so many lives, as we respond to climate change and biodiversity loss that threatens our very existence, and as we see lives destroyed by the unattenuated aggression of violent forces, such friendships are more important than ever. I take heart from the fact that working together and with urgent intent, there is a path to build a future for humanity that is sustainable, prosperous, and just. Our Commonwealth family is, and will always remain, a free association of independent, self-governing nations. We meet and talk as equals, sharing our knowledge and experience for the betterment of all citizens of the Commonwealth, and indeed the wider world. The Commonwealth contains within it countries that have had constitutional relationships with my family, some that continue to do so, and increasingly those that have had none. I want to say clearly, as I have said before, that each member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. The benefit of long life brings me the experience that arrangements such as these can change calmly and without rancor. But as I said in Barbados last November, we should never forget the things which do not change, the close and trusted partnership between Commonwealth members our common values and shared goals, and perhaps most importantly, the strong and enduring connections between the peoples of the Commonwealth which strengthen us all. These shared values, goals, and friendships transcend the ties of shared history, as we saw in welcoming Mozambique and Rwanda to this great family of nations. And now, coming to Rwanda for the first time, visiting the genocide memorial and speaking to survivors, 
I have been overwhelmed by the resilience, grace, and determination of the Rwandan people. Today, Rwanda upholds so much that is extraordinary as a center for innovation, a world leader in women's empowerment, a growing hub for the green economy, and a commitment to a united future. As leaders, you consider how to define and strengthen our own commitment to common purpose. And I would only offer you the view that our Commonwealth family of some of the world's most vulnerable and some of the world's wealthiest nations has the ability, indeed the obligation, to be a force for global public good. Why else, ladies and gentlemen, would an increasing number of countries want to join this association? In the diversity of the 2.6 billion people on whose behalf you speak comes great strength, which you can use, for instance, to speak up for the values which bind us, to invest in a rapid transition to a sustainable future, and to create opportunities for our young people. I believe that the Commonwealth is uniquely positioned to achieve such positive change in our world. And in speaking to you over the years, I know you agree. Indeed, I can only applaud the focus you are bringing to supporting youth, business, and civil society, not least through the Commonwealth professional associations of judges, teachers, and midwives, to name but three. I know the importance you attach to ensuring that support reaches the developing world, and how important is the work you are undertaking to develop new approaches which take account of climate vulnerability to enable the better channeling of development assistance. I was also greatly heartened at yesterday's business forum to see Commonwealth leaders and global CEOs, including from my Sustainable Markets Initiative, identifying practical solutions to these vital challenges. To achieve this potential good, however, and to unlock the power of our common future, we must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. Many of those wrongs belong to an earlier age with different and, in some ways, lesser values. By working together, we are building a new and enduring friendship. In Canada recently, my wife and I were deeply touched to meet many of those engaged in the ongoing process of reconciliation. Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples reflecting honestly and openly on one of the darkest aspects of history. As challenging as that conversation can be, people across Canada are approaching it with courage an unwavering commitment, determined to lay a foundation of respect and understanding upon which a better future can be built. It seems to me that there are lessons in this for our Commonwealth family. For while we strive together for peace, prosperity, and democracy, I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many, as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. If we are to forge a common future that benefits all our citizens, we too must find ways new ways to acknowledge our past. Quite simply, this is a conversation whose time has come. Your Excellencies, conversations start with listening. And as the Queen said at our last meeting, the Commonwealth has always been and remains a global association which believes in the tangible benefits that flow from exchanging ideas and experiences 
and respecting each other's point of view. Our ingenuity, knowledge and ideas, our courage and determination are truly our common wealth. By unlocking our potential, we can build a future in which all our people have a stake, ensuring that our Commonwealth Charter represents not just words on a page, but the lived experience of all. And in so doing, we will equip our children and grandchildren to be agents of a better future. Your Excellencies, if we are to leave the world better than we found it, and that is our duty and our privilege, we must be bold with our ambition, decisive with our actions, and united in our effort. In this mission, I know Her Majesty the Queen stands with us all. It's a pleasure and honor to welcome you to the 26 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, the sixth in Africa, and the first since our world was turned upside down by a devastating pandemic. The fact of holding this meeting in Rwanda, a new member with no historical connection to the British Empire, expresses our choice to continue reimagining the Commonwealth for a changing world. The Commonwealth does not replace other institutions. It adds to them. That's why we always have important special guests with us. This year, let me recognize in particular His Highness, the Emir of Qatar, and I thank him for being here with us. The Commonwealth we need is on the front lines of global challenges, not on the periphery, watching events unfold. Our special strength is to bring issues into focus that we might otherwise be overlooked. For instance, the way that climate change puts the very existence of small islands and developing states into jeopardy, or the possibility to transcend size and geography by leveraging new technologies to create high quality global jobs for our youth right at home. We are united by a shared language, whether English is our first, second, third, or even fourth one. But what really defines us are the values enshrined in the Commonwealth Charter and the commitment to good governance, the rule of law, and the protection of rights. That's why we shall always remain open to new voices and new members. And whatever we might fall short, we find solutions through consensus and dialogue. We build each other up and we move forward together. In closing, I want to welcome you all to Rwanda. Ours is a country that was torn apart by genocide and division just a generation ago. Today, we are a nation transformed in heart 
mind and body. Three quarters of our population are young people with no memory of those events. Everything we do, including joining the Commonwealth in 2009, is aimed at making sure that our people are connected, included, and forward-looking. We are delighted that through Chogun, you have the opportunity to get to know us, and we aim to repay that trust with many years of continued friendship. This Chogham has been a long time coming. The period since we last gathered together has been marked with sorrow. More than one million of our brothers and sisters across the Commonwealth, from all walks of life, including heads of government, have died. And as we formally open this vital meeting, I invite you all to join with me in a moment of silent reflection in memory of them all. Excellencies, in 1953, Her Majesty the Queen shared her vision for a Commonwealth which bears no resemblance to the empires of the past, to an entirely new conception built on the highest qualities of the spirit of man, friendship, loyalty, and the desire for freedom and peace, an equal partnership of nations and races to which she would give her heart and soul. She has given her heart and soul. In the year of her platinum jubilee, with heartfelt thanks and the greatest admiration, we pay tribute to her. And we warmly welcome her representative and the future head of the Commonwealth, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Her Majesty's vision remains the standard against which we judge ourselves as a family of nations. In 1919, at the end of a war which killed millions, during a pandemic, which killed millions more. Leaders gathered in France, striving for an internal peace. Their quest was noble, but it failed. That future had failure, had profound and devastating consequences. After the horrors and bloodshed of the Second World War, it fell upon a new generation to shape a just, and lasting peace, and the international system as we know it today was born. The Commonwealth is part of that system, brought together to bring a touch of healing to kinships which were changing, but which continue to bind us. I believe profoundly that the Commonwealth today, in 2022, is a beacon within that international system, a place where people come together, where we work together, where no voice is louder or more important than any other, and where no one is left behind. Yes, we have shared interests and practical advantages, but we are the most significant grouping of countries in the history of the world, which is bound above all by values 
which we all aspire to. These values of peace and justice, of tolerance, respect, and solidarity, and our role as the foremost international champion for small and vulnerable states remain our enduring responsibility. They express a vision for the world that will outlast all of us. They make us different. They make us special. Honoring these values and that vision is our most sacred trust and our gift to the generations which will follow. Today, as we gather in the midst of new and decisive shifts in our world, it is imperative that those values shape the choices we will make in the hours and days ahead. The economic damage of COVID and mounting debt confront us all. The rapid intensification of climate change poses an existential threat. The tremors of conflict and instability in our world, the spiraling costs of food and fuel and economic uncertainty threaten a serious and protracted crisis. This chogam is first and foremost an opportunity to find answers to these questions. It will not be easy. We will have to dig deep. We will have to respect each other and find what joins us. We must trust each other. We must talk and listen to each other and give all that we have to, to achieve progress for the 2.5 billion people we all represent. But here, in Rwanda, something else is at stake, something even more transformational. The world is changing. People are anxious. I understand the pressure on each and every head of state today. The last few years have shaken the kaleidoscope. But before the pieces settle, we have an opportunity right here, right now, to show the world what real unity, real solidarity, real cooperation, and real progress look like. To have served as your Secretary General these past six years is the great honor and privilege of my life. Together, we have been friends in good times and in bad. Voices for the voiceless, advocates for development and progress. We have laid the foundations for transformational change. And I am determined that when the role of Secretary General rotates to Africa two years from now, I will hand on the baton with a stronger, more effective, more powerful Commonwealth than ever before. I have an unshakable belief that we can take our Commonwealth to new heights, to hold our values ever closer, and to set an example for the whole world. As Her Majesty the Queen has said, it has always been easy to hate and destroy. To build and to cherish is much more difficult. This week, face to face with each other and in the presence of her son and heir, we have the greatest opportunity we will ever have to live up to those words. It is a huge task, but if our history tells us anything, it is that we can 
seize the moment with confidence in our values and each other. And I thank you. <laughs>